this week, we are sitting down with Joshua Vilness, uh, president of the Jabberwocky Literary Agency, um, for an interview. He is, uh, he's actually represented several of the books we've already reviewed. Uh, we're so happy he agreed to sit down with us. Uh, Mr. Vilness, thank you for, thank you for uh, having us. My pleasure, Ryan. And how are you today? Good. Good. Um, so, so, let's start uh, chronologically. Um, so, in your bio, you mentioned that back in high school, you used to write critiques for Analog Magazine. Um, did you always see yourself in publishing, working with books, uh, or was that more of a no, hobby? I mean, yeah, I, uh, I was a high school student. I was writing letters to the editor. I had no idea where it would go to. certainly wasn't anything I planned. Uh, and what got you started writing those letters? Um, you know, you're a nerd, you're interested in something, somebody actually writes back. Um, it was like amazing. So. So you were, you were surprised, uh, were, were you surprised when Betsy Mitchell asked you to freelance? Yeah, I mean, as I said, it wasn't like I had done this thinking, oh, this is my path for job. I, I had absolutely no idea, just kind of from out of the blue. Um, what was that experience, what was that experience like when, um, do you know, do you remember what in particular uh, drew her attention to you, why she chose to ask you to freelance? Well, I mean, so when I was writing the letters, I was commenting on uh, like every story in each issue and Basically, just, uh, you know, looking at what I was saying and I, you know, uh, like, y you'd have to ask her for the definitive, but, you know, basically just looking at that and saying, so here's somebody who seems to know what they're doing when they talk about what we're publishing. So... Maybe I can get something out of that. Um, right, and, and what was your experience at Analog like as a, as a freelancer? Well, so I wasn't at Analog. Betsy hired me when she was uh, lured to help start Bane Books. So that's where the first actual job was, was at Bane Books. And it was a little bit of everything. I did readers' reports. I did uh, synopses for manuscripts they'd already purchased but needed, like, what is this book about for different people. I stuck uh, Bane stickers on portfolio folders for sales conference. Um, a little bit of copy editing, but that wasn't really my thing. Um, uh, you know, going to uh, get keys duplicated at the local hardware store was pretty much everything. Uh, and so, this was was this still in high school when you were freelancing? No, I mean that was by then in between my um, sophomore and junior years of college that I was first doing that. Um, and what made you decide to go into agenting instead of, uh, instead of publishing? For, uh, I specifically wouldn't why, say that why, um, why Scott Meredith instead of Van? Well, it wasn't really a decision. You know, the uh, Bain job was like a part-time thing. Um, was a small company, so they, you know, weren't like creating a position for for me, um, you know. And I was looking for a job out of college, and the first thing that came up was from the Scott Meredith agency. That was the first offer I got. There was no real master plan to it. It was you're looking for a job after college. This is the one that comes up. It obviously helped that the people at Scott Meredith um, represented Stan Schmidt at that time, and he was the editor of Analog, so he knew me. 
And of course, Scott Meredith and Bain did a lot of business together, and Betsy knew me. So there were people who were, you know, probably putting in a good word for me. Um, that makes sense. That, um, yeah, I guess, I guess the, the connections explains a lot. Um, so what was, um, what was your experience working at the Scott Meredith Agency like? Um, it was, um, wonderful in a lot of ways. Um, the setup at the agency, um, you're not supposed to charge reading fees when you're a literary agent, but Scott had been doing it since the 1950s or whatever. Um, and um, so part of the job that I had to do was customer service. Uh, people would write or call with questions about the reading fee program. I would field those. Um, you know, somebody would, would want to know why, uh, you know, why we weren't asking for a revision on their manuscript based on what we had said in their uh, critique letter that we sent back, and I'd have to come up with the spiel to give to them. Um, so that was part of the job. But the other part of it was, um, you got a lot of responsibility very, very quickly while you were there. Um, like I walked into a desk, as it were, and that desk had clients assigned to it. Um, Harry Kemmelman, Carl Sagan, Ellery Queen, the P.G. Wodehouse estate. There were a lot of things that basically the moment I walked into the particular office that I had at the Scott Meredith Agency, I had some degree of like connection or responsibility to. Um, a lot of times that just meant being the person who got the check that was going out to the client and got to type up the memo. Keep in mind this was the late 80s, every place didn't have computers yet, to say here's your check for Japanese royalties in the gross amount of $63 less commission, less tax, and that's the net amount of the check. Um, got to do a lot of that. Um, but I also remember like one of the first times that I got to argue with a uh, you know, powerful editor was a guy named Hugh Van Dusen, a real veteran at our Harper Collins, who came and said, so I want to do this P.G. Wodehouse uh, collection and made his offer, and I looked at the numbers and got to go back and say, no, that's ridiculously low. And um, there aren't a lot of places in the publishing business where you'll get that kind of responsibility pretty much right away. Um, so I started there in February, and by like July, I had already sold my first book. Would um, that be uh, Mary's Grave? Yeah, Mary's Grave by Malcolm McClintock, which, uh, you know, first book I sold. Um, so, in big picture, kind of that was the Scott Meredith experience. Um, you got to learn a lot just by being there. Um, you know, I was in the office next to Russ Galen, who had been there 10 years longer than I, and had a you know, had an incredible responsibility. Arthur C. Clarke, Marion Zimmer Bradley, Philip K. Dick Estate, um, Tim Zahn, um, like just all sorts, Mercedes Lackey, all, all sorts of, you know, really important people and just sitting at a desk and being able to listen to his phone conversations from one room over was a great learning experience. Um, learned a lot about foreign rights. I don't think that Scott Meredith did a great job selling them, but I was able to see the potential there. Somebody from 
Hayakawa visits the office twice a year. They're like the big Japanese publisher for science fiction and fantasy. And you tell them, here are three books we're excited about. And they go, okay, we'll buy them. Um, you've got to see from handling all of these checks that an author could do really well in France, even when nobody knew who they were, really well in Japan. You could just see the potential for what could be done. Um, there was stuff to learn about how not to run an office. Um, uh, you know, Scott was deep down very cheap. Um, the office we'd been in, uh, the company had been in for, for a very long time, and it looked, uh, you know, worn around the edges. Not the way I wanted to do things. Computers were starting to come into existence. For most of my time at Scott Meredith, we had one K-Pro to handle mail merge for multiple manuscript submissions. And otherwise, Scott was resistant for a really long time to getting computers in the office. And you learn, don't starve the beast. Um, you can't do that. Um, I also learned everything counts, which was a positive lesson. Um, the Scott Meredith Agency, for all its like wealth and riches and powerful clients, it was founded on the idea that you could sell the first book by a Marion Zimmer Bradley or an Arthur C. Clarke for a few thousand dollars. And from that, amazing things could come. Um, it doesn't all have to be big bets, throwing huge money down for things that you're hoping will be huge breakouts. You can actually just start with something and build it into something bigger. One of the most powerful memories that. Um, when I took on Real Murders by Charlene Harris, the first Aurora Tea Garden book around 1989, um, I really loved the book. Um, I thought it was great. And I sent it out to every mystery publisher and ended up getting one offer from uh, Janet Hutchings uh, at Walker Books. Now she's the editor at Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine for um, not even $5,000. And I was crushed. And when word got up the chain to Scott that I was upset about this, he sent me one of his famous notes on a white three by five piece of index, uh, <coughs> index card like memo pad to say he was really happy with the deal. It wasn't easy breaking an author back into the market because she'd taken a few years off, kind of given herself um, maternity leave after her first couple kids that it wasn't an easy thing to do, and I'd done a really good job, and you know he was happy enough about that to send me a little note of encouragement. This was, as I said, not even a $5,000 deal at a company that represented Norman Mailer and Carl Sagan and Margaret Truman and all of these important authors. And that meant a lot to me, and I try not to forget that. Wow, that is, that is quite the lesson. Um, so, I want to go back to uh, Mary's grave for a moment. Yeah. Um, so that was the, so you mentioned that was the, the, first, the first book you represented. Uh, did you get that as part of, like, was it part of the desk? Did you get that by yourself? Uh, and what well, was it like representing it? Yeah, so that had, in fact, come in through the reading fee program. I don't even know why it 
did, in a way, because the author had some stories published with the character in Alfred Hitchcock's, but he didn't have a novel, so you want us to look at it, you got to send your $250. That was the official attitude of the Scott Meredith Agency. But it came in, was passed up, as they said, with the recommendation that we should take it on. The author's last name began with an M, and that was in my part of the alphabet, which was like F through O or G through O or, or something for, for dealing with these things. So it arrived on my desk, and it looked good, and I sent it out, and it sold. So... Um, so what led you to create Jabberwock? Um, was it in any way related to your uh, particular difficulties with the Scott Meredith Agency? Well, I mean, yes and no. Um, you know, Scott died in uh, February 1993. Um, there were senior people at the agency who'd kind of hoped that they would get to take over from Scott, but there hadn't been anything firmly put in place. And they ended up, after a few months, deciding that it would be better to, uh, to go off on their own. Um, that was like Russ Galen, uh, you know, who's still around at a Scoville Galen Gauche, um, and a couple other people. Um, and so that was like May. Then in August, um, a new owner comes in, a guy named Arthur Klebanoff. Um, and, uh, you know, and there was a culture clash, really. Um, Arthur had made his name, um, and he was using the purchase of the Scott Meredith Agency as like a vehicle to start in his own after being part of the literary management uh, team at um, a large, uh, like, kind of Hollywood-oriented agency. But his focus, he didn't have a lot of clients, but they were all very big. That was things like the Roger Tory Peterson Bird guy. Um, the uh, Sheila Lukens, who wrote this, co-wrote the Silver Palace cookbook, which was a very huge thing. Linda Goodman, who had the Sun Signs astrology books. Um, Senator Bill Bradley, the former NBA player who became a senator from New Jersey. Um, and um, he was buying an agency that, as I mentioned earlier, was really founded on something completely different. Um, you know, the idea that you could represent and sell somebody for five or ten thousand dollars and build from there, um, just kind of an alien concept. To Arthur. Um, so after like a year or so of trying to meld his philosophy or, or, or graft it onto the roots of the Scott Meredith Agency, it became clear to him that it wasn't really working out the way he'd hoped. So a lot of us were given the opportunity to go off and do new things. Um, ah. <laughs> so. That's an interesting euphemism. <laughs> all right, and that's all we have bandwidth for today. Thank you for watching the Book Cafe. If you enjoyed this video, remember to show it by clicking the like button, or click on the dragon here to subscribe. You can also watch more videos like this here. We'll be uploading the rest of the interview by the end of the week, so until then, Read good fantasy.